The James Madison football Dukes were back in black and they had a comeback victory scoring the last 17 points to claim a 31-24 homecoming triumph over the tribe of William and Mary make a lot of homecoming fans very happy. Welcome in to the Coach Everett Withers Show. I'm your host, Kurt Dudley, and congratulations, Coach Withers. Uh, yeah. First homecoming game, first victory, and as you said, it's important for the fans to get that victory on yeah. homecoming Saturday. Well, yeah, it's always important for the fans and for the alum coming back and the ex-players, ex-athletes, ex-students in, in general coming back to homecoming. And uh, it was a festive crowd. It was cold, but, it, you know, it was football weather. And, uh, you know, thankfully we were able to come out and get a, get a nice victory. You finish the month of October undefeated, 3-0. and right. You go into what you're calling the fourth quarter of November. Right. Not a bad way to start it by extending your winning streak to 4-0 and during this, uh, the last four weeks, five weeks actually. But at this time of the season, it becomes more important because you can give your team some relevance at the FCS level. Well, that's important because of the way the uh, playoff uh, structure is, is uh, manipulated. Uh, we're able to, you know, win games and, and you know, try to put yourself in position where people that look at you say, hey, maybe this is a playoff team. But, uh, you know, our goal right now is just to try to win one game at a time. Uh, the playoffs are really a, a long way away for us. And uh, what we're trying to do is to be focused on winning, uh, w winning our next ball game. Certainly concentrating on one game at a time. you got to win the next one to get to the next one, of right. course. Let's talk about this one that just did pass. Right. The Dukes, uh, they did, did have a great fourth quarter. What was it that helped to really turn the tide for the Dukes and give you some rhythm offensively there in the fourth quarter? Well, I felt like our defense played well the entire ball game, and I think that gave our offense some some clear, you know, clarity that uh, they could go out and play fast. We just were not in a rhythm in the first half, and I felt like as the third quarter uh, ended and the fourth quarter started that we felt like we had to get going, and our offense did. Uh, we made some third downs. We weren't very successful early in the game in third downs, and we were able to pick up a few third downs uh, in the fourth quarter, which gave us an opportunity to move the ball, keep drives alive, and our, and our tempo started and I think that was the, the biggest factor. You always want to start with rushing the football and that was right. very difficult in the first half. We may talk a little bit more about that but the way the game opened up in the second half you mm -hmm. had some very big receptions from right. two of your real big receivers. One the tall receiver in Daniel Brown and then of course the tight end and that's Dean Cheatham who's been catching a lot of footballs over the last three weeks. Well Dean's been a been a target of, of ads for a while. I mean he's found him down the middle of the field in a lot of a lot of you know different ball games and different route concepts but uh, Dean's one of those guys that Vag can find in the middle of the field. He's very sure handed. He runs good routes and what it does it allows us to, to spread the field so guys like Daniel Brown uh, can get the one-on-ones on the outside of the field and, and Daniel obviously had a career day for us and uh, it was big because he was able to have some one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside. Yeah, and that's uh, really where you kind of softened him up. Uh, you were explaining how William and Mary was not bringing two over to the edge. Go through that with us if you would. Well, we were, we were in empty backfield a lot or motion into what we call empty backfield and they were taking their coverage to the motion. The motion was away from Daniel. So what it did, it allowed the coverage to go away from Daniel. They rolled the coverage to the motion. Daniel had a lot of one-on-ones backside with a corner. So that was, uh, that was part of the plan in the second half to see if we can get him isolated. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, well, certainly you do win the ball game, but it all started off with a pretty good defensive effort for the Dukes. Now, two out of the last three yeah. games, your defense has played pretty well. And do you feel like you fit the run a little bit better this, this yeah. past weekend than what you have in the Past. No question. I felt like uh, overall we played a good front seven uh, tight ball game that we needed. Our, our front four has been playing pretty well most of the year. Uh, we've been pretty pleased and consistent with uh, with the with the effort and uh, the execution of those guys. We needed to play better at linebacker, at safety, and at corner. And and is uh, when you talk about fitting the run, so we felt like our backers did a much better job. Really, cha I really challenged our defensive football team. I challenged our defensive staff this week to be better because we knew we were going up against a very talented offense in, in, in the aspect of running the football. Quite frankly, you made William Mary one dimensional. I mean, yeah. other than uh, Michael of. Uh, Sabor, right. not many out of their players were much of a threat to you. Well, that was the key. The key was to take, you know, it, it, you know, try to take him out of the ball game if we could. Uh, he's a he's a talented running back. I think he had over, still had over 100 yards rushing. Uh, but but over that, it was just him. Uh, we took away the the, the wide receiver uh, uh, McBride, he, who caught four balls, uh, I think for 29 yards. 
Uh, so we were able to do some things to limit some of their big play guys, some of their focal point guys, and to me that was a key in the ball game. Yeah, McBride actually, they, I think they wanted to actually limit his touches. They only had him back for returns for a couple right. in the ball game because he's been taking a lot of bruising. I sure. think, understand, you know, most recently. Uh, Sage Harrell was right. named the co-defensive player of the week. Uh, he finished with nine tackles, uh, three, yeah. four behind the line of scrimmage. Three of those were were sacks. Uh, he is certainly playing an all-conference or having an all-conference season. Yeah, he's playing at a really high level for us. Sage has really consistently been the leader of our defense this year. Uh, with the way he practices, the way he goes about his business each day in preparation for a game. Uh, I, we looked up the stat uh, uh, a couple days ago. Sage has 9.5 uh, sacks. He has 14.5 tackle for losses. In that, he has accounted for 126 yards of negative offense wow. for our opponents. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a lot for, for, for one guy. And uh, Sage is having a tremendous year, and we hope he continues to do that because if he does, our defense will continue to get better. Well, right now he's second in the league with overall sacks with nine and a half, you know, as you mentioned. Uh, as we continue to move forward, uh, first of all, uh, you really brought out a surprise uh, when you opened up the ball game. <laughs> Well, it wasn't even. It was before the game. Yeah. The black uh, unis came back again, and right. for the first time, we see the uh, the chrome purple helmets. Yeah. That's something that's been on your mind uh, about the day that we were here at this facility <laughs> and signed you uh, to your contract. Was yeah. it not? Yeah. Well, you know, when you when you're coming in, you're always trying to get something new to your program. We're always talking about new era, new things. Uh, change is good. Uh, we wanted to do something. I, I, you know, I do remember the gold helmet that's been at JMU for a long long time uh, we felt like we wanted to do something a little different bring a gold helmet we knew it was a purple out so we wanted to bring the gold hel helmet involved in the purple out uh, we've been talking about the the black unis uh, really from day one uh, and there's a group of people that I'd like to acknowledge, the Alpha Dogs, who uh, uh, really a, a group of, of people really enthusiastic about JMU football uh, and ex-players, uh, uh, ex-students, uh, just people around the community and around this, uh, this part of the country that really have a, a, a real enthusiastic uh, nature about them for JMU football that have really donated financially to help us. Uh, help us do, do the helmets, do the uniforms, do things like that. It was quite impressive, I thought, that you kept it a secret. Yeah. You know, today <laughs> in the modern uh, Twitter sphere and everything, that uh, exactly. you did keep that to within a very select group right. and, and did pull that off. You also mentioned that uh, this is kind of, now certainly there are the traditionalists, sure. but you're not recruiting the traditionalists right. exactly. to play football. Mm -hmm. And what you're recruiting to is a young generation that kind of likes these new things, this yeah. swag, as you say. So yeah. this is a marketing, this is a recruiting tool as much as it is anything else well anything we do in our building with our uniforms how we do things is all about recruiting and uh, you know it's the lifeblood of any football program any athletic program that, that does recruit uh, so this is really important for us to show our young 18 17 year old kids uh, that we do have a, a variety of, of, of uniforms. We're not just the old traditional uh, JMU uh, purple and gold. We can do some different things. So uh, along with this helmet uh, and the black unis, we'll be able to do some different mix and match things uh, for the rest of this year. And then next year we'll have a surprise, hopefully again, to do some, some even better things next year. You know what's really neat, I think, too, is that you can, you can put the old stuff on the shelf for a while, but yeah. you can bring it back out and make it a vintage uniform every once in a while. And you see that through throw back even to those Oh my goodness, those awful uniforms that Pittsburgh wears, you know, <laughs> as some people don't think too highly of those. But So yeah. it does give you a, a chance to, to mix and match and, yeah. and make a fashion statement. No question. And that's, that's all about trying to market your program. And uh, that's something that we want to do a much better job of, is really trying to sell JMU football up and down the East Coast and, and across the country. How do you think the team responded to homecoming, your first homecoming here? Because there can be a lot of distractions. Around. Well, I, I thought they handled it well. Uh, uh, our kids were really locked in and focused. No they were playing a, a number 16 team in the country, uh, very talented, very dis, uh, disciplined football team. Uh, so I felt like our kids did a great job of handling the distractions. Uh, they handled uh, the, the, the storm early in the game where we weren't playing real well on offense and uh, our defense kept us in the game. So uh, I felt really good going into halftime knowing that we hadn't played our best effort on both sides of the ball and even in the kicking game. 
uh, but we were still within uh, striking distance. Yeah, there were so many things in that game that we could pull out real quickly, though. You decided to go for one instead of two yeah. when you pulled it within 24-23. Why that decision? Well, on the headphones as we were driving down the field, we were talking about uh, which we would do. And we talked about going for two most of, the, most of that drive. We said, hey, go for two, go for two. We got down and end. We said, you know what, let's make sure that we get points. And if we get points here and they happen to go down and score, even though we're playing really good defense, we're within one score uh, of being able to tie the game. We can get a touchdown, go for two, and tie the ball game up. So we didn't want to be two scores down. Uh, so going for one, we felt like our defense would either stop them. If they didn't, we would get the ball back with four, three minutes left in the game and have an opportunity to go down the field and get a two-point conversion to tie the game. And as we see, the Dukes don't need a lot of time to put points <laughs> up on the board. So congratulations once again. Yeah. The Dukes try up in 31 to 24. We're going to take a time out here on the Everett Withers Show, and when we come back, we'll have more for you on JMU Football. Office products, we buy right so you can do. That's right. At Office Products, we do things right. With our multi-million dollar inventory of new, used, and refurbished furniture, you're sure to find exactly what you're looking for. From desks to chairs, filing cabinets, and so much more. All the major brands that you're looking for. Office Products, we buy right so you can too. Office Products, we do things right. Hey, did you know Harrisonburg Nissan has the best selection of pre-owned cars in the Valley? With something for everyone. Best selection, locally owned, number one volume dealer, it all adds up. Check it out at HarrisonburgNissan.com. Clear to zip. Break a little. Good job. Game on. Welcome back, everyone, to the Coach Everett Withers Show. Time to go a little deeper into the playbook with our Chalk Talk. And again, we have defensive coordinator Brandon Staley, and he'll be followed up by offensive line and co-offensive coordinator, and that is Brad Davis, here with a little Chalk Talk. Hi, I'm Brandon Staley, the defensive coordinator at James Madison. I'm here to review a couple plays from the William & Mary game. We want to thank the homecoming crowd for our best atmosphere yet, you know, braving the elements. We had a true home field advantage and it definitely helped us in the fourth quarter when we needed it the most. And uh, we particularly needed it on defense to finish off the game. Uh, the first play that I'm here to review uh, you know, happened you know, in the first quarter. It was on their second possession. This was after a sudden change. It was a fourth down and six uh, on the 28 yard line in their territory. They elected to go for it. And they're in a uh, 20 personnel look, uh, which means they have two backs in the backfield and three wide receivers. Uh, and you'll see that, uh, you know, they've got a cut split here with their best player, Trey McBride, number three. And we're in nickel defense here, and we're going to be bringing a field fire zone. All right, we're going to bring the three defensive linemen, Rakeem Stallings, and our star, which is our nickelback, Marquise Woodyard. And we're going to be playing what we call middle of the field fire zone coverage. Um, and so if you take a look at our nose guard, Simeon Robinson, we allowed him to stand up in this spot. Our two defensive ends are pinching inside, all right, and then Rakeem and Marquise are coming off the edge. And there's a couple things that make this whole play happen. Number one, we've got really good blitz timing. Um, we knew that when they got into 20 personnel that they were going to slide away from this guy. So we knew we wanted to blitz this man. Um, so that's why we're bringing the pressure to him. And so you'll see that Marquise is free. But what you don't see is that the coverage up here at the top with Jimmy Moreland all right, he's step for step with the X receiver up there at the boundary. All right, Marcel Johnson, who comes down in the slot, is really tight to his man. And then Taylor Reynolds is all over Trey McBride down here at the bottom. We're able to get a big sack fumble there, and it was a big momentum shift in the game because they had gained some momentum with the fumble and, um, you know, the block punt early in the game. But you'll see here, we're pinching both defensive ends, and it really allows Simeon to wrap free. We get the two off the edge with Rakeem and Marquise, and 
you know, Marquise finishes the play with the sack fumble. Really proud of Marquise. He was a wide receiver. He's a senior. Um, he's done a great job the last five games playing for us and been a big factor in our success on defense. I want to show a few clips here from our game on Saturday against William Mary. A uh, really, really hard fought win. Uh, and a win that we're really excited to, uh, to get against a quality opponent. Really want to highlight and talk about some of the play of our skill position players, in particular one of our receivers, uh, Daniel Brown. Here's a player early in the game, go six trio right field, go switch, okay, and essentially it's an empty formation here, and what you'll see is that we're just getting uh, vertical space and horizontal routes, uh, or excuse me, vertical routes down the field here with horizontal spacing, but, uh, you know, not in particularly, uh, you know, a, a great uh, you know, route or any of that kind of stuff by, by Daniel. It's just him going up making a play. And this is a byproduct or result of he and Vad spending you know, hours and hours and hours uh, you know, just throwing and catching and uh, really building that relationship between one another and, and, and really just trusting each other. Uh, you know, decent job of protection by our offensive line here, giving Vad some time to throw the ball. Uh, but really just an exceptional play by Daniel here. Really proud of him. He was our player of the game uh, this week. Thank you very much there, Coach Davis. Now let's introduce you to one of the other assistant coaches on the, this staff here for Coach Everett Withers, and that is Steve Sisa, who played his college football just down the road of peace at Bridgewater College. More with Steve. Really, when I found out I was coming, I'm very excited to have a chance to work with Coach Withers again. Um, first off, I had a great uh, experience with him at the University of North Carolina, and I uh, was really, really just excited to have a chance to work with him again. Excellent, excellent coach and just a really great mentor to me and really I've been hoping for a long time to get a chance to work with him again so that was that was really exciting uh, the second part that was really exciting was really coming back to Virginia I grew up in Northern Virginia Manassas I went to school start off at Bridgewater College right down the road which was a to really kind of a homecoming to come back to this uh, to, to this area this region and always had a tremendous amount of respect for this school uh, its academic tradition and also the football tradition my coaching career has been kind of, uh, you know, unorthodox when it comes to this, you know, this level, the college level. You know, I had, as I mentioned earlier, I started off at Bridgewater College, um, but it was really a very fleeting moment for, you know, for my football career. I, I really didn't make it through my freshman year before my career was over, um, and so it was been a long, it's kind of been a long road for me to, to really get into this profession. Always loved the game of football. It really was kind of an outlet for me to really just go and kind of be hidden behind a helmet, and just work hard, and and, uh, and really the, the entire team concept was always very exciting for me. Um, so when I got out of college, I you know I wanted to get into coaching. I, I started off at the high school level. Was at uh, Ed White High School down in Jacksonville, Florida, where we had. Really a very, uh, very fortunate to have a very good program down there, made the playoffs a number of years and advanced to the regionals uh, a number of years. Um, and was, was tutored by a guy by the name of Dan Dish, who's now at the University of North Carolina. And he, uh, three years after he had uh, hired me, I was able to help me get on at University of Illinois to kind of get me a foot in the door in college. And from there, you know, you, you, this, this level is all about connections and really had some great opportunities. Uh, to move on to the University of Southern Mississippi, um, and then to North Carolina, and then and then prior to coming to James Madison was at Western Carolina, uh, coaching the secondary there, trying to help build a program. I think it's been really exciting. You know, we've we've been able to, to do some really exciting things with a, with a relatively young team. Um, you know, we've had some young guys, particularly in the secondary, that have really stepped up and played. You know, we we started we started a number of games with three three true freshmen back there, and defensively a lot of young guys across the board. So to see their growth and development's been very exciting. Um, there's obviously challenges and frustrations along the way because every coach wants things to happen a little bit quicker. Um, but this was uh, this has been an exceptional exceptional year up to this point. Really excited to see what this program has for this you know this last quarter so to speak of the season, uh, and hopefully leading into some few, uh, some some more games as well. So. And Telos wants to give you more for the holidays, like two gigs of data and unlimited talk and text for just $25 a month. That's a better value than Verizon and AT&T. And nothing says happy holidays like getting the smartphone you want for zero down. And Telos will even buy out your contract. It's $25, two gigs of data, and unlimited talk and text. Happier holidays from Intellos. More phones, more lines, more data. Get more for the holidays from Intellos.
At Harrisonburg Nissan, right now, you can get 0% financing on select models. Hey, keep your money. Use Nissan's. We'll honor and beat all buying service prices. We want your business. Check it out at HarrisonburgNissan.com. Office products, we buy right so you can do. That's right. At Office Products, we do things right. With our multi-million dollar inventory of new, used, and refurbished furniture, you're sure to find exactly what you're looking for. From desks to chairs, filing cabinets, and so much more. All the major brands that you're looking for. Office Products, we buy right so you can too. Office Products, we do things right. Clear to zip. <laughs> Break a little! Faster! Very good job! Game on! If you buy now at Harrisonburg Nissan, you won't have to make a payment till 2015. But don't tell anyone. If the word got out, everyone will be buying there. Check it out. HarrisonburgNissan.com Welcome back to the Everett Withers Show, everyone. The landscape of college football and, quite frankly, the NCAA is always changing. And here most recently, well, it's been a lot of up and downs along the way, and it certainly does affect every institution, member institution. Well, here at James Madison, Jeff Bourne is the athletics director, and recently we chatted with him about that very subject. Probably the most difficult days I've had in the 15 years here were the sport cuts in 06. That, um, that, that takes years off your life, and it, it's a very difficult thing to go through. Um, Decision-wise, we're on the other side of it. Uh, I think the right decision was made, and we're, we're, we're moving in the direction we need to be. Uh, the conference issue is trying, because those are issues that, as a director or an institution, you don't have direct control over any of that. You can work and you can try to influence and you can do all the things as an institution that you possibly can. But those decisions are driven by a lot of different factors. They're driven, driven by economic factors in some case. They're driven by other conferences. They're driven by syndication rights and all these factors that uh, we'd love to think that we control, but we don't. So the question is how do we navigate through that and put the institution in the best position we can be long term. Our biggest challenge is sitting right now in, in 2014 saying strategically based on the national climate of everything that's happening in the NCA. And even though we had obviously ideas that this would eventually happen 15 years ago, it's accelerated through and it's at the doorstep now. And there's going to be a tremendous amount of change told the staff a month ago, we'll probably see more change in the next five years than the, than the collegiate world has seen in the past 40 or 50. Monumental change, and what does that mean? How do you as an institution, how do I as an athletic director anticipate and navigate through that so that I'm able to give good information to our board, to our president, to our administration, to make sure that we're going where we need to be as an institution? And to say that that's not challenging, it is. It's extremely challenging because there's a lot there that we can do, but there's also a lot that's being dictated uh, at the highest level. So, you know, it's going to be interesting in these next couple of years to see how this impact and this change, this division of conferences, how that affects uh, JMU and other institutions at our level, uh, both in our conference and outside our conference regionally and nationally before it's over and done with. And then how do we take advantage of opportunity? Because one of the things I do believe is that in every circumstance like this, there's always opportunities to be taken. And that's what we're looking for. That good opportunity, that time for us to be able to do those things that makes our program, our coaches, our staff, our alumni, our donors feel good about where we are and what we're doing.
Welcome back to the Everett Withers Show. As we wrap up this week's show, we're going to talk about the Duke's next opponent, the Sea Wolves of Stony Brook, as the Dukes go back up to Long Island, but to uh, Stony Brook for the first time, a second year program in the Colonial Athletic Association, Coach. And what we're going to have this week, as you well know, this is a matchup of the top offense in the league against the top defense in the league. How do you think these two are going to clash? Well, it's going to be a, a, a very interesting game and a very uh, uh, big time uh, atmosphere for us to be able to go against such a, a, a big time uh, defense. Uh, number one, I think in total defense in FCS football. Uh, number one in our league, they're they're one or two in most of the categories throughout our league on defense. So we've got a very big challenge for our offense. But I think our, our guys are uh, really excited about it because uh, this gives us the opportunity to really kind of find out really where we are offensively. Yeah, you know there are four individuals who have more yards rushing in the season than what the Seawolves have allowed their opponents total right. this year. It's just unbelievable, just limiting 84 yards on the ground, about 150 or so in the right. air. Right. I know you want to rush the football. Right. Is that where you'll start it again this week? Well, you know, we'll, we'll have to do whatever they allow us to do. <laughs> you know, we're going to have to do some formational things and try to figure out where they're going to line up. They're very aggressive, big up front. Uh, I think it starts with their down, uh, they're, they're down four guys that, that, are, that are very physical and big up front and move well. Uh, they play really good at linebacker. Their secondary is unbelievable. They run around. They make plays. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out where the soft spots in the defense are. We would like to be able to get back, obviously, to running the football because that's what we want to do this time of year. Do they bring specialized blitz packages or something yeah. that may put your offense a little, well, at, at – at off on their heels at yeah, times, they, maybe? Yeah, they do. They do, Kurt. What they do is they, they really disguise blitz as well. They bring corner fires. They bring safeties. They bring linebackers. Uh, but they do a good job of disguising it with their coverages. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a very unique uh, defense. That, I mean, and I say unique, they, they're, they're bringing exotic blitzes at times, uh, and you don't know where they're coming from. So we've got to do a great, great job of IDing it with our, with our quarterback, with our linemen, with our back, so we can uh, keep bad protecting and be able to throw the football. So when you're looking at a blitz situation, you were talking about that. The communication mm -hmm. there, does it yeah. start with that or does it start with your, your center, uh, Matt Cunningham? Where yeah. does it start? It really starts at both guys. Uh, Matt will really ID the, the linebackers and, and see where they're, they're located. Vad usually is the guy that's going to ID where he thinks the pressure's coming to get the protection in the right spot so we can protect them and get the back slid away from the protection. So uh, those are things that, that have to work together and they have to work pretty fast. Yeah. Well, Coach, they only score about 16 points a game. Their top running back, Stacey Bedell, he averages 93 yards per game. He's fourth right. in the league in, in rushing. But other than that, they don't have any standout players right. uh, overall. Well, you know, he's a talented running back. So, obviously, our first thought is to stop the run, uh, not give up big plays off the play-action pass. So, if we can do that and make them get them in third and long situations, we feel like we can be successful. We've got to find a way to play better in the kicking game. That's got to help us. Uh, if we can do those things and, and then our offense find a way, which our offense says all year long, find a way to, to make some plays, uh, we feel like we've got a chance to go up and, and, and be successful. All righty, Coach. Best of luck this week Thank against you. the Seawolves as the Dukes take a 6-3 and three record and a 3-2 and two Colonial Athletic Association on the road. For Head Coach Everett Withers, I'm Kurt Dudley. Thank you for joining us this week on the Coach Everett Withers Show.